So this is my dad, Gordon Williamson, and this is our third part to his life story. He's going to talk about, he's going to pick up from the time that he joined the Air Force. Go ahead, Dad. Okay. Uh, I turned 17, and me and my buddy that, that I grew up with uh, was, uh, turned, was going to turn 17 five days later, so we waited until he turned eight, 17, and we joined the Air Force on the buddy system. Uh, the buddy system was supposed to be, we would spend all our Air Force career, that's the way he told us, together in the same outfit. Oh. But uh, that didn't work out because as soon as we got out of basic training, uh, he was sent to someplace else and I was sent to some other place. So we, we did get to see, see each other in Japan uh, while I was over there. But, you did uh, get to see each other? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but basic training was an interesting thing because I had never been away from home and I, I expected to be, you know, affected by that, but I, I adapted to it immediately. I had no problem whatsoever. Uh, but we had some really uh, interesting times in, in basic because I was the big dumb farm boy, hick farm boy, and we had a lot of, of sophisticated city boys in there. And we had this one guy from... Uh, Chicago, or Detroit, anyhow, he was always trying to, you know, play on my hip farm, you know, dummy, but, so he told me this one time that, and, and he had his followers, you know, that kind of like hang around with him, so they would always, you know, sit behind him and giggle when he fooled me, I think he fooled me, and so he told me that if I took my and the, and the uh, garrison caps they had was, the, was the, like had the bill on it, had a metal, uh, I don't know, stay, what do you call it, like a girdle stay, you know, that, that went around to keep the hat round. Uh -huh. He said, if you take that out and, and undo it and you can stick it down inside the coat machine and you can get a free coat. So I said, okay, I'll try that. <laughs> so they're all peeking around the corner giggling, you know, waiting while I'm doing this. And I, I messed around a couple of times, and all of a sudden, coke comes out. And it worked? And their mouths were gone. Ah, they just made that up, but it really worked? Yes. I was so, I was, you know, like that so much. Uh, and then one time, uh, <laughs> he uh, he was going to, they had what they called blanket parties. You know, the people they didn't like, they would, they would sneak up on them when they weren't looking and throw a blanket over their head and start hitting them on the head with Coke bottles and stuff. Oh. And, you know, they were very cruel. But this one time, I seen them sneaking up behind me out of the corner of my eye. And he, I was fully dressed. I was polishing my boots and had fully dressed. And they, especially the, the ringleader, the, the Chicago or Detroit guy, I mean, he was just in his boxer shorts. And just as he got close to me, he threw the blanket over my head, but I reached up and grabbed him by the, mm -hmm, by the gonads, and I hang on real tight, and, and they started to hit me, and he says, wait, guys, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm hanging on real tight and squeezing tighter. And I said, tell the boys to back off, take back the blanket off my head. And they, they, they backed off and says, hurry, hurry, put, hurry. Cause he's squeezing tight, so I made him back off the other end of the bar barracks, and then I, I let go and I ran out the door. Oh my gosh! Well, you had to do what you had to do. But oh. the thing is, from that point on, he respected the fact that I was took took you know that control. You fought back. And he was my buddy from that point on. Oh, that's how it always is in the movies. And yes. Stuff. The, and I guess my, the, the, uh, they respect the the. Uh, I learned some a very very uh, important you know, thing about myself. Lesson, you know. Uh, and and uh, we had what we call biv a bivouac. Uh, one morning, uh, about three a.m., the trainer or DI uh, direct uh, we call him DI for direct. I don't know what he. But anyhow, it was like the the. Trainer, wake us up at 3, 3 a.m. and told us we had to get our packs ready and we're going to take a 20 mile force march and we then bivouac in, 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 in the boondocks. So <clears throat> we've been marching in, in every 
10 minutes, he'd be blowing his whistle to tell us we had to hit the dirt, you know, it was training for like, we were gonna be attacked by an airplane or something. So we had to hit the dirt and get on our bellies and crawl. Mm -hmm. and, and the ground was frozen. So our elbows and our knees were getting bloody because of the, you know, the hard, surface. hard surface. And after about 15 miles, I was so tired that I was, I was figuring out that, that, that there was ambulances following just in case anybody got hurt. And so I figured I'd just go ahead, I'm gonna drop out and uh, yeah, let the ambulance take me back to the base because I just ain't got another ounce of strength. I'm so tired. I'm gonna, when I get to this next telephone post, I'm gonna drop out. So about five feet away from the telephone post before I was getting ready to drop out, a guy about three guys in front of me dropped out. And when he did, they started beating the crap out of him. They would hit him and they would kick him and they would hit him with their pistol belts. And all of a sudden, I says, I can, I can go another hundred miles. You got miles. another win. I, I, as, <laughs> but what it taught Show me was, second win. yes, what it taught me was that it, no matter how tired you are and, and, and exhausted, if you really come down to it, so you, mind to you've it. got more, in you, you've got more in you to it. I was and cracking that, up because I remembered you telling me the story before, yeah, so it was funny. That that was that's helped me in my life, yeah, you know, because yes, there's been times when I was just so pooped that I thought I was gonna fall over, but I knew that I that was that, that, that stored uh, strength. There's more we, energy in us than yes, we think. Yes. That, yeah, that's but, hilarious. <laughs> now, now we get down to. I the, can do it after all. <laughs> yeah, now we get down to. Uh, I, I was on my. Uh, uh, were you in Japan when you were saying all this was happening? No, this was still in basic training in, in Parks Air Force Base in California. Okay. That was a uh, basic training base. Uh, but my first permanent party was uh, was where you was you know you actually graduated from basic, and you were doing something you know in, in real, real time. Uh, was uh, at Blackland Air Force Base, which was in uh, the other side of San Antonio. I, I was. Was one side of San Antonio, Texas, and I was what say permanent party. So I was. Why is it called permanent party? Because I was not a basic. This is a training base also. Lackland was a training base also, like Parks, and we had all these Emmer basics that that, that uh, were learning just brand new, you know, and mm -hmm. marching and stuff. And so I was permanent party, so I was allowed to wear civilian clothes, and I was in the in the. Uh, my barracks was right next to the barracks, the, the uh, uh, dining hall that the basic trainees went to. So when basic trainees first come in, the first days, first like first day, I guess it is, they are in their civilian clothes. They call them rainbows because they they would had different kind of clothes on. Oh. So this uh, this mess hall mess hall that we that I was in, uh, I had finished eating. And I was standing out on the, on the kind of like porch area of the, and, and this second phase basic training trainee assumed since I was wearing civilian clothes that I was a rainbow. A rainbow okay. And he started telling me all about how this man's air force is and how is this you know trying to clue me in on, on all that stuff, right? <laughs> and uh, so. While he was doing all that, uh, I said, "I got, well, I got to leave." No, you can't leave until I allow you to leave. You know, I'm the uh, upper rank, you know, because he was a second phase basic. And when he did that, I says, I pulled out my wallet and showed him my class A pass that, that showed that I was not a basic trainee. I was above that, above above him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He got so embarrassed, and he started saluting me with both hands. <laughs> <laughs> but you weren't able, you still weren't supposed to be saluting. I wasn't supposed to be saluting, yeah, really, but he knew that I was so far above, above him that he, <laughs> so. That's hilarious. But then I got shipped over to Randolph Field, which was the other side of San Antonio. Uh, and I was working in the, uh, living in a crew research lab. Uh, so uh, it was right next to the basic uh, the, 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 the swimming pool, and I was working in midnight shift. So uh, I was always had my days free, and a lot of times I would even though I was supposed to be sleeping, I would go out and go swimming at the pool. And this one day I was, talk, I was talking to this older woman, and uh, she she struck up the conversation, and she uh, said, 
there was a young, beautiful redhead laying down on this cabana right beside her. And she says, oh, by the way, this is my daughter. And she tapped her and says, I want you to meet. I had already told her my name, so she introduced me to her daughter, to her daughter, and she just looked up at it and said, eh. <laughs> and then laid back down again. But uh, that led to, later on, uh, next time I saw her, I started talking to her, and her mother wasn't there. And uh, we got to know each other, got acquainted, and then started dating. And... Uh, the minute I actually saw her, I, I knew that was the one that I wanted for the rest of my life. That was Frances. That was Frances. Jarrett. Yeah. Was she go by another name at that time? Smith. Uh, no. Yeah, she was. Uh, Smith. No, that was. Oh, what was his name? Maiden name. Uh, Larry. That was Ma Lundy's. No. Son. No. No, no that was a different. I can't even remember that. I don't McLean. Know. Not McLean. McLean. Yeah. McLean. Okay. She's Frances. She's Frances McLean. But uh, she, she, we, we got to where she, I took a ring one time. She had her class ring or some kind of ring, and I took it away from her, and she told me that she'd do anything, just anything in the world to get that ring back, and which left me to believe that she might like me a little bit. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, we got to be dating, and we went on a lot of dates together, and, and we were very, 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 very close. <clears throat> And uh, then I had to go, they uh, gave me orders to ship to Japan. And when I, uh, we, we, the night that I was, the, the day that I had to leave, uh, I picked her up in her house before school. I was taking her to school to, our, to have her. She was still in high school? Yeah, she was in high school. And uh, uh, I wanted to we'd say our last goodbyes, you know, and, and I dropped her off at school and <clears throat> doing a lot of kissing and hugging. And then I drove off to California. And I got out about two, three hours, maybe four hours. And I had plenty of time because I was going to have a 10-day leave, a uh, 30-day, no 10-day leave, yeah, uh, when I got to home. So, but I, I just had to see her one more time. So I turned around after four hours driving towards California and turned around and drove back. Oh, my goodness. And when I got back, it was... Just school had just let out, and so I seen her walking home. I pulled up behind her, and I honked the horn, and she turned around and seen who it was, and she just dropped her books and come Aww. running, run, running into my arms. That was the most uh, romantic. Oh, thing. you ever told us that story? Yeah, I've never heard that story. That's yeah, so sweet. She, yeah, she, <laughs> and we kissed and hugged and for an hour or so, and then I finally. Had to go. Took her home and... <laughs> this time for real. Yes. yes. <laughs> this time I'm really leaving. <laughs> so in, in the... Uh, I, I, was, I got shipped over to Japan. And... Uh, one moment before... Uh, on, on that 10-day leave, there was something else. Even though I knew that I was wanted her for, for my life partner... Uh, when I got to uh, California, my cousin Billy had a girlfriend. <laughs> I'm not sure if that was that leave or another leave. It, anyhow, uh, we were in there, his house, and, and he had uh, uh, Sharon and Billy and a bunch of kids. Sharon's my cousin also, his sister. And I liked her, but his, but Billy's girlfriend liked me. So he would, we were by ourselves, me and, me and, and uh, I think Sharon had a boyfriend, and Billy had a boyfriend, and I was stag. So I was just sitting there. Billy and, had a girlfriend, you mean? Yeah, what I say? Your girlfriend? Boyfriend, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, oh, one of those. No, and she, uh, <laughs> he would uh, turn the lights off so it would be more romantic, and it was completely dark. And when he did, he got up to turn the lights off, and when he turned the lights off, when he went back to her, she wasn't there. She had come and sat in my lap. And we were kissing and hugging, and uh, he turned the lights on and said, "Oh, get back over here!" So she she go back over there. He go turn the lights off again, and she <laughs> come jump in my lap again. And uh, Lucy. Yes, and so we we uh, you know got I actually took her away from him, and when I went back to Japan, back to uh, the base, this this wasn't before before I went to Japan. This is another time, but. She was writing me letters, you know, and I was writing her back. And uh, 
we was, you know, all lovey-dovey and Tamahashi might love each other and so forth. And then this, this lasted for about a month. And then all of a sudden, the, she'd write me a letter saying, why don't you write me? And I was writing her almost every day. And she, she wrote me a letter saying, what, why don't you love me anymore? Why don't you write me? Why, why, what's going on? What's it? And I'd write her back, I am writing it. What's going on? So she'd write me back. And so this one, she sent me this postcard. So that I guess she assumed that I was just not even opening letters and throwing them away. So he wrote me this postcard in red ink and with teardrops all over it. Wonder why in the world I wasn't writing her anymore. So I figured something was happening with my letters. So I wrote her, I wrote a letter, and put it in an envelope, and then put that envelope in another envelope and addressed it to her mother. And 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 in in, in the letter I says, told her. Check your mailbox. Watch your mailbox, because somebody is stealing your letters. I am writing you almost every day. So she spied on the mailman and found out it was my cousin Sharon. It was stealing the letters, my letters from her, because she also had the hearts for me. Oh, you, so this was when you were in Japan or not in Japan? No, this is. I think it was one of the, one of my days that I just took, took leave and, and came to California. So that's before. Mom yeah, before or after mom, mom. Yeah, before Okay, mom. so yeah. now you're, that was just a little excerpt that just yes. got out of order. So now you're going to Japan. Now I went to Japan, and uh, while I was in Japan, uh, me and Francis would write, you know, not every day, but oh. quite often, you know, two, three times a week. And uh, after about, I, I stayed in Japan two years, so I think it was probably about a year and a half. She it wasn't really a dear John letter, but she wrote me basically that she wanted to start dating other people, and uh, I didn't like that too much. But I figured, you know, that's life. So uh, when I then I six months later I got uh, transferred back to the states, and since I was uh, had less than 180 days left on my four year uh, service obligation. Uh, they did. They just gave me an early out, <clears throat> with you know, honorable discharge and all that stuff, and so I was just uh, working in California and dating this girl and that girl, and uh, I still you know thought about her a lot, but I figured it was over. I was, I was long gone, you know, because so she wrote this dear, dear, dear John letter. And then I also I got this. All of a sudden, I got this letter from her. Uh, after six months, and she said she she had a she sent me a airline ticket. To, she was her uh, stepfather was stationed in Bermuda, and so she gave me sent me this airline ticket to Bermuda and said that she wanted me to come. And I, I'm not sure if she said in outright that she wanted to marry me or not, but but. Uh, but she did. Okay, well, hold that thought. I want you to go back to that, but I want you to talk a little bit about when you were in Japan, what it was like, and you got off the plane, and what did it seem like? And well, it was interesting when I was in uh, when I, I first when I got uh, first base that I was in in Japan was called Shiroi, Shiroi, and that uh, in Japanese that, that means white, and uh, I was about. Uh, Five miles outside of Tokyo. The, the, at that time, Tokyo was the largest city in the world. Yeah, still is pretty much. Yes, close to it. Uh, it's not now. I don't think so. I think something else is. Still a really yeah. big city though. Yeah, but <clears throat> I, uh, I I went to Tokyo quite often, uh, and this little train that went uh, that from Shiroi to Tokyo. I can remember still the, the little cities that they went through and stopped at. Uh, it was uh, the first one was Matsudo, and the train man, the, the conductor would always come saying, "Coming into Matsudo," or you know, he said in Japan, but so blah 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 Matsudo, and then next one would be Wayno, blah blah blah, blah Wayno, and then, and then Tokyo. So we sp I spent quite a bit of time in Tokyo. Uh, yeah, one time me and his buddy were in this bar in Tokyo and I had a few drinks so I guess we were just feeling real good and we were going to go to another bar and when we walked, started walking toward the door we noticed this big potted palm, palm tree in, in a pot, you know, probably about five feet tall 
and it had handles on it. So we just we stand got hold the handles, kept walked out on the bar with the with the potted palm, and the bartender was or one of the guys in there was not happy with that idea. So he was they were hollering at us in Japanese, which we couldn't understand at that time, and uh, we ha hailed a cab, and the cab stopped, and we were trying to get this potted palm in the in the uh, cab. <laughs> And the bartenders were still hollering at us, and the cab driver was starting to holler at us because it had a cab with an open roof. And uh, I was standing inside with you know, my head out the roof, trying to pull it in, and my buddy was <clears throat> outside trying to push it in. And when I looked down the street, I seen two Jeeps uh, with red lights on coming with the Jap Japanese police. So I decided we didn't want, <laughs> we didn't want that part of foam. And I just jumped out of the cab and we ran down the alley and, and, and got away. It's so silly. But like, so when you first got to Japan, did it, was it like culture shock? Did it look totally different? Did the houses look different? Did well, it was it... definitely, it didn't seem to, it wasn't culture shock because I was so easy to, to assimilate, you know, and take my, wherever where I was. I, I don't understand why I didn't get, you know, culture shock or, Homesick. Homesick or stuff. But it, it never, never, that kind of stuff never affected me. But the houses were different, definitely. Of course, the downtown Tokyo was just like a city, you know, so it was all, all brick and, and mortar and all that mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, Did it, you have it, super high rises? Oh, yeah. And I remember the Matsudo Hotel. It was down on the main street of Tokyo. And we used to we'd go in there several times for uh, beer bus and, and parties and stuff. I remember one time we was at, we had this big old party and uh, had a lot of food and a lot of booze, <clears throat> and all of a sudden a, a food fight erupted. People were throwing you know hamburgers and everything else, and and, and I didn't want to get in on this because I was you know I had this Japanese uh, girl who was a what was she you know party girl. <laughs> Geisha. Yeah. Well, it, no, she they call it Geisha? Okay, yeah. go ahead. Uh, and so we just, I, me and her, crawled under the tables to get out of the debris, and I picked up a uh, couple of bottles of, of uh, whiskey, and we crawled on our hands and knees out the door, <laughs> and, and left this party because we didn't, we didn't like the food fight. So we went to our, her little, they call it a hooch. Not that her house, only it was just it's a room, and drank and had a party of our own. So did you understand? Well, did, she, did she speak any English? Or she oh yeah, most all the girls, the Japanese girls that that, that would go with the good GIs, they could speak English, pidgin English sometimes, but yeah. we get our uh, enough to understand. Uh, yeah, and uh, and they had hamburgers and stuff. Oh yeah, well they had American food. In Tokyo. Yeah. This is Tokyo. Yeah. This is so what kind of food, uh, other kind of food did you have a lot when you went to Japan? Or you always ate American food? No, there was what, uh, I can't remember the name of it. There was a skiaki. Skiaki, I guess it was. It was kind of like a, a, a slimy beef stew, but it was good. Uh -huh. And uh, of course, they always had rice. Yeah. Everything was served with rice. Yeah. And I remember one time also, speaking of uh, another incident, me and this buddy who, uh, oh no, this is down, down in Misawa, so in Tokyo, I had a, uh, they have a tradition, uh, they didn't want to lose face. In other words, if they promised yeah. something, they would deliver. It. Honor was a big, was a big yes, thing for them, yes. right? And I got to talking with this Japanese guy who was a, one of the upper class guys, and he, we always, would, would, when we find the girl, we, we was always having the, the, the low class party girls, if you know what I mean. But he said that he had some, he wanted to show me the high life of the, 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 the geishas, the girls who was also party girls, but they were higher, higher class. class. So we got a cat in the cab, and he drove me a couple places, and. and when he went in and came back out and said nobody was there, so we drove some places. But four or five places that ended up not not going to, uh, not, not, not having the girl that he was wanting. So he finally said, okay, I know this one girl for sure. So he drove me and she couldn't even speak English hardly. 
but just barely, just a little bit. And he said, you can have her. And after I had her, we, he, with her broken English, she told me that that was her fiance. Tacky. He was so, did not want to lose face that he gave me his fiance. That's, that's too much. I know. So, like, uh, what kind of le words did, were the first words that you learned in, in Japanese when you... When well, you I that? learned uh, this good morning and, and good evening. Oh, so how was that? Ohio you gozaimasu. remember how to say it? Huh? You still remember how to say it? Of course. Ohio, Ohio gozaimasu. Konnichiwa. Kumbawa. That's, that's good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And uh, then, of course, uh, I learned uh, which means how much. <laughs> And uh, I learned a lot of Japanese. Uh, konnichiwa. I remember uh, okari arimasen de show. Yeah. I don't have any money, understand? <laughs> yes, I learned uh, okari means money, and uh, arimasen, or arimas means have, and arimasen means not have. <laughs> so I would always teach my girls when they were growing up, my daughters. Uh, when we wanted our allowance, he didn't have any money. <laughs> we learned that word. We learned yeah. that phrase. <laughs> he lied. He had money. Yes. Uh, and uh, then there's lots more uh, incidents I had in in Tokyo or at at Shiroi. Uh, the the one the, 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 it was the first couple of weeks I guess it was that I was in Shiroi, uh, Air Force Base. We have a, a airman's club that had actually uh, booze and strippers. And I had, you know, I was only 17. Or I guess I was 18 by then. But I had had mixed drinks or, or uh, you know, maybe I had a beer when I worked out in the field when I was in the, on a farm. But I, I was not familiar with the fact that you don't mix your mixed drink, don't drink whiskey and then rye and then... Tequila, rum, and stuff, and yeah. Yeah, rum, but I so I was making all kinds of rum. I was getting just really, really completely out of my mind drunk, and they were going to have a strip show later on, and I was determined to see that strip show, but I got so drunk that they kicked me out, ah, <laughs> and uh, I snuck back in, and then they called the air police, and they escorted me back to my barracks. And I snuck back, snuck back down the road, and we got back in again. And then they uh, come and called the air police again, and they came and took me to my barracks, and took my clothes off and hid them in my room, you know, so I couldn't find them. And my roommate, who wasn't there, was about six foot six, weighed two eighty or three hundred pounds. He put his clothes, <laughs> put his clothes on. <laughs> and I remember uh, I was. I was so drunk that I was passing in and out of memory, my man, where I did. You're blacking out. Blacking out. And I remember I was, I woke up and I was on my hands and knees on, on a cinder block path. And I'm walking on, on my hands and knees, looking down at the cinder block. And I noticed when I come up to these pair of, of uh, white spats, there was two guys with white spats on. And that's. Uh, like officers? Air police. Uh oh. And so I. <laughs> So I says, uh, is, there, "Is there a problem, officer?" <laughs> he says, "Where are you I'm going?" I'm being nonchalant here, crawling yeah. on the ground, wearing clothes that are way too big for me <laughs> in the middle of the night. And then I also I passed out from that. Oh, I do remember uh, waking up again, and I'm standing in front of this big, tall, high desk the guy was standing standing, standing behind, and like an, an Air Force officer in uniform, and he was a provost marshal, and they was gonna they asked me for my Order my class A pass, and I had only been there, I hadn't been there long enough to have a class A pass. So I said, I don't have a class A pass, but I have my orders, you know, which just showed me that I was being transferred. So I showed him that, and then I passed out again. And then I remember I, I, I'm, I'm back at the Ammons Club, and they recognized me <clears throat> from being kicked out so many times. So they wouldn't let me in, and I, I was being very belligerent and cussing this guy and calling him all kinds of names, and he was in civilian clothes. And a friend of mine happened to see what was happening, and he walked over and told me, whispered in my ear, that you're cussing at an officer. So 
I was, even though I was drunk out of my mind, I was, I understood what he meant by that, so I stopped cussing the officer. Mm. And uh, Nothing ever happened after that? Did yeah. you get in trouble? You didn't get thrown oh, in the barracks or whatever they call it? You get, get you know, restricted and, and uh, maybe even lose his stripe and all that stuff. Did you get in trouble? No, I, I, he was, he was understanding that I was... Luckily, they gave mind. you so many chances. Oh, yeah. You kept coming back, and they didn't, like, put you in the but barracks. I never did see that, uh, that strip show that time, but, but I saw some later, you know, days later, I saw one, my first one in my life. And then... Uh, I got shipped to, uh, orders to ship to Masawa, which is a little country town on the uh, northern tip of the main island of Japan, uh, uh, Honshu. I was, I was, uh, the main island called Honshu. And it was a little, little, little peasant town. And, I, and there was a guy that was in my barracks, or in my squadron, I guess, that had uh, never had, he was 25 years old, he was older than me, and he had never had a woman. He'd never been able to even have a girlfriend. But these Japanese girls were so friendly <clears throat> that they would they would have you basically rather than you have them. So he fell in love with her, and he wanted her to marry. Him. And that was you know you, you you didn't want the Air Force didn't want you marrying these call girls, so they decided they ship him to Misawa with me. And of course, when he got to Misawa, he got another girl and wanted to marry her. <laughs> oh my goodness! But uh, Misawa was a, a very different, almost a different language uh, in a sense. They had colloquialisms like a, I guess he's like a, a, a New Yorker and a Alabama uh, guy. You know, they, mm -hmm. they, they had their words were slightly different. Mm -hmm. Some of them were not all of them, because uh, I remember one particular thing to say in Tokyo. To say come here is kokoi dashe, but in Masao it was oide. That almost sounds Jewish. Yeah. <laughs> and they had other words that was different than that too. And, and it was a, most all girls that, uh, that were going with the guys, you know, were, were, spoke very good English. Mm. And uh, they had what they call a stand bar. Uh, that was the girls all were behind the bar. I had a bar that was went you know all the way around the room, and the girls in, in Tokyo the girls would be sit you with the table at the table with you. You know you could play with whatever you wanted, and uh, in, in the stand bar they they stayed behind the bar, so it was a little bit more restricted. But uh, I don't know. I guess I probably shouldn't tell this one. Yeah, don't tell don't tell any more stories like that. But boy, they're. They're just people that come to the places where the servicemen are, the women? Well, they lived in that, in that or little, that's little, how little town. All, all, the the, the Masawa had it was a Masawa Air Force Base, but it was a, also a town called Masawa. It was right outside the uh, main gate. And we had the, the bars that was uh, what they call AP Alley. The, the, all those, that, that alley was lined with... Like black light. What do they call that? Black light? Red light. Red light district, yeah. kind of like that. Yeah. Okay. But but actually, no, I guess it was because the girls were, they were, were bar girls, you know, V girls, uh, but they are also prostitutes. And you could, you know, not in the bar, but you could take them out after and yeah. so forth. And, and it was, the economy was such that, that the, uh, uh, at that time, the yen, which was the, well, their dollar, was 360 yen to the dollar. Mm. And you could uh, buy almost as much with one yen as you could in America with one dollar. So it's almost like getting $300 for, for one dollar. And uh, that's sad, actually. Yeah, that well. The poor girls were that desperate that they yeah. sold well, themselves. Well, they, like they were, you know, they could have a lot of money because they, they didn't only charge you uh, about three yen, three dollars. For a, a good time, and, and uh, one time this is really weird. One time, a they for some reason I don't know why the prostitution was was legal, and they had uh, they had have a, have, a, have a card you know a medical card, they had to go be make check sure they're they're clean so to speak, 
But then for some reason, for a period of about three months, they decided to outlaw prostitution. Hmm. But of course, that didn't make us stop doing it. And I remember one time I was, we were, me and a couple of guys were up in a room with two girls. And in Japan, in Japan, blue, blue, uh, you don't wear shoes in, in, indoors because they, the floors and, and, uh, are made out of straw and straw mats on it and the shoes would, would uh, destroy it. So I remember we were up in the second floor and we could hear hobnose, hobnail boots coming up the stairs. And we knew that, that, that the GIs would take off their shoes. And of course, the, the women would never have their shoes on. So we knew it could only be APs, Air Police. Mm. And it, it was at that time, the prostitution was illegal. So <laughs> me and my buddy were not fully dressed. Basically, just nothing. And we jumped out a second story window with our clothes on, under our arm into about four foot of snow. <laughs> mm. And ran down the alley. APs are, are like military? Military police, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. This is like MPs. Okay. Army MPs. And, and then that, that, that same buddy of mine, me and him went to a uh, movie one time. Just uh, He had a motorcycle. And so we rode the motorcycle to the theater and we went to a, a movie. Oh, we bought a combat jug of go do wine, which is uh, what it was, was, was a about, it's a gallon, but it came up and then it had a big, long neck. And we took that into the movie with us. And we drank it and got completely snuckered. And when we came out of the movie, we could hardly walk, let alone ride a motorcycle. But we got on a motorcycle and took off down towards the base, which is probably five miles away. And we were so drunk that we both passed out and, and wrecked the motorcycle and, and woke up you know, after I don't know how long, in a, a snowbank. <laughs> mm. You're lucky you survived all those shenanigans. Yeah, and now the, another another time there during the summer year, summertime, where it was warmer. We, me and him, and a couple other guys, uh, decided to steal a farmer's cow. And in in Japan, they have uh, they fertilize their fields with human waste. Ew, that's not good. And they have a, a hole, they, cut, they dig a hole about five foot by five foot by five foot deep and water and human waste is mixed in that hole and it's, it's irrigated with that, right? So he, my buddy, the same guy that, that, that had a motorcycle, was leading his cow, backing up. He was pulling his cow because the cow wasn't being very cooperative. And he kept pulling the cow, and the farmer was shaking his pitchfork at us and all that stuff. And he fell in this, <laughs> what do they call it, honey the bucket? The farmer? Hole. No, no, the, the my, guy that my was buddy. trying to steal the yeah. cow. And he, he fell in his hole, covered with, with human waste. And that was so amusing that the farmer even started laughing. <laughs> but uh, he was, when he got out, he was you know, covered with it. And luckily, we were only about. 20, maybe 200 feet from the ocean. So y'all went swimming? So he, no, he, we didn't, just, but he did. He just jumped in there. And, What's the water like there? Is it like the Pacific Ocean, freezing cold? Like no, no, it was, it was warm. Not warm, but So what but not, ocean uh, is that considered? Yeah, yeah. What is it? What? What ocean is that? Uh, I don't know. Is it Atlantic, Atlantic, I guess. Atlantic, okay. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. I don't know if it wasn't that cold. Okay. So, but he, he washed himself And it was summertime. Off. Yeah. We also worked, we stole, seems like we stole, tried to steal a boat too. Can't remember that. You were a bad boy, naughty boy. But we had a, uh, uh, we were, we, in Misawa, we were on the main base. We were a, 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 a mobile group called 26, 26, 29 mobile, uh, mobile group which is about 10 miles off the base, but it's, it's still connected to the base, but it's off the main complex there. And uh, we had a compound that was, uh, I, at that time I was, uh, had a uh, top secret crypto clearance because we 
what we were doing, we were spying with radios, uh, shortwave radios on the Russians. We weren't too far from Russia on that, that, that main, you know, the southern. Crazy. So anyhow, uh, this compound was uh, guarded by Japanese uh, security, I guess it is. And so we had we had probably about 40 feet between the main building and the barbed wire fence, which was 10 foot high. And, <laughs> and uh, there's several incidences that happened in that compound. Uh, one is uh, the, the uh, we had a guard a gate that was always guarded by American uh, military police. And uh, they were always trying to check them to see how good the guard was. So the security, the main security officers, the, you know, when I'm talking about security, I'm not talking about the security guards. I'm talking about, we were, that was, I was a security service, but we weren't like security guards. We were security because we were doing secret things inside the compound, right? So the officers would try to come, try to catch the guard making a mistake by wearing like Hitler on their badge or Stalin or something like that. And uh, this one big black guy, black officer, he was captain, uh, had a gorilla, picture of a gorilla on his badge. And it was a rainy, rainy night. And, was, and he come in and, he, and the guard was also black. No, I'm no, the, the, yeah, the guard was also black. Big, you know how some of these big monster black guys and he seen this picture of a gorilla on his on his, his officer's captain's badge, and like I said, it was a rainy night and red and all was, And he grabbed the officer, threw him down on the ground, pulled out his forty-five and put his knee in the guy's chest and the forty-five in his head and said, "Move, Matt, MF, and you're dead." And the captain, even though he was, you know, being tortured, he gave him accommodation for it. Oh. And, oh, and he said, why did you let me go? With, uh, oh, maybe it's the other guy that had the Hitler on it. The, guy, the black guy with, with, with the grill on his badge got through. And he did that 45 to his head and his knee and his chest from the guy who had Hitler on his badge. But anyhow, he let the, the, the black guy with grill on his badge through. And he went about 10 feet in and turned around and walked out and said, what's the idea of letting me through with this picture of a gorilla on your back, my badge? And he says, I'm sorry, sir, but it looked like you. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. And another one, another time, a uh, guard, we, we, have, we were getting some renovations inside our uh, compound, and the people that were doing it were Japanese nationals, you know, the civilians. And we had... We always had to have uh, armed guards when anybody that, that without a uh, clearance was in there. So they, they I don't know why, but anyhow, we had a uh, uh, big maps on the walls, and we covered them because we didn't. It wasn't secret, but we didn't want to get them, get them dirty, right? So while they were in there, uh, the something had happened. And one of the coverings fell off. And of course, the Japanese nationals thought that was secret. Yeah. So, yeah, so, well, see, no, 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 look, you know, look, you know, see. Yeah, they're going to get in trouble for yeah. seeing it. <laughs> yeah. and, and another incident, uh, a uh, work, you know, national, Japanese national was coming in the, the gate, and between the gate and the, the uh, compound, and for some reason, one guy got. He terrified of because they're, they're guys with rivals escorting him, right? And uh, he he panicked and took a, started running toward the fence. Was going to climb the fence to get out, and one of the guards shot him. Oh no! And Did he I? wasn't he wasn't punished. I don't know why he did. I, I can understand why you know he's, he's trying to run out. Did, the guy, did the guy die? Yeah, yeah, shot? he died. He killed oh, him. No. They, they all they did is they made him pay for the bullet. <laughs> so 
So was when, when was the time that you had like a little house boy that you paid a little tiny bit of money and he took care of your house and stuff? Oh, that was when we were stationed at, at the mobile group, and he he lived in that barracks with us, and he uh, would do our laundry and polish our boots and stuff like that. We paid him. He, did he cook your food and stuff like that or no? No, we had a, a, a we had a mess, mess hall that we ate that. Oh, okay. So. And you guys, you had your own little house or hut? Or? No, it was a barracks. Oh, just the room? Oh, he, okay. That's yeah. weird. So he lived in the room with y'all? No, he didn't live in the room. He lived in, in, in a another room in, in the barracks. Oh. And, and one time in that barracks, so in the wintertime, uh, we, we had to wear almost like Eskimo parkas, you know, with the fur around the area. And we had this one little guy, uh, small. He was a lot smaller than the rest of us. And the parka wheelie didn't fit him well. He was too big, and you basically you, you, it would hit us around about the knees, but it, it, it actually dragged the ground. On oh him. my gosh! So somebody I remember walking to, walking from the barracks to the compound in a snowy winter day, and somebody said beside me, "Who's that parka walking over there?" Because I always see it was the parka. Uh -huh. And uh, during the, the, the uh, summertime, uh, the, uh, there was a guy. This is strictly all men, right? And somebody was talking about Susie in, in, in the compound. And I said, Susie? Yeah, I didn't know there's any women in the compound. Oh, yeah, you haven't met Susie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they led me down to the end of the hall there, and, and a bunch of police radio operators were over here, and met Susie. It was, it was a a homo guy. Oh no! Was bringing out police on that lot and, and a very, very, very swishy. Was he Japanese? No, he was. He was one of the guys. He was one of the people in the Air Force. Yeah. And he was gay, dressed up like a woman. No, he was, you know, regular military uniform, but, but just nail polish and acting yeah, very yeah, feminine. Yes. Oh my goodness! <laughs> you were like, no thanks. Yes, and another time in back in the winter time, I remember we lost power on our barracks, so no heat, no lights. And I, I was, even though I was not the, uh, a higher rank, I had a room by myself that, because I somehow claimed it when the sergeant left. And the rest of the guys was in open bays. And uh, anyhow, uh, it was very, very cold. And we, we didn't have no power and no lights. And I was freezing my fern off. I was wearing my long johns. And even though I was going to bed, I, I let, wore my wool uniform and my wool overcoat. Wow. And I was still, and of course, the blankets, I was still freezing. So I went over to one of the, be the beds in the bay that was empty and took the big mattress off it and put that on top oh of it, gosh, too. Oh, my gosh. Did they have any heat? No, I said we lost power. Oh. So it was, it was uh, very, very cold that night. Terrible. Yes. I can't think of anything else happening in the compound. So the compound's like a whole bunch of buildings? No, it's one big building. We call it a compound. Does it have like a big fence around it? Oh, yeah. Like, like I said, about 40 guarded. feet. That was to protect you all from the regular Japanese people or what? Well, it was because it's... It be, the military base. Military. But because it was top secret crypto, Okay. Uh, they, they had not only... Guards inside the fence between the building and the fence. They also had guard dogs. Wow! And a guard at the at the gate. The guard in, inside were Japanese uh, security, I guess Japanese uh -huh. police. Huh. And the guard at, at the gate was a, was a Air Force guy. Wow! Military guy. So it was just top secret because it was just military stuff, just United States. No, it was it was because we were secretly. Spying on Russia and China. Oh, we had what they did was they they would uh, they had shortwave radios. They had a whole row of, of a whole bunch of guys with shortwave radios, earphones on, and they would search and find data uh, Morse code. Oh, and they would uh, you know, they. Would <laughs> I had a buddy of mine later on when I was after we got married that that would, had done the same thing. He could actually type on a typewriter. He listened to uh, you know with one ear and hear Morse code and type it and carry on a conversation with me. 
Mm, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, well, when you do it every day for you know years, you, you do that. I I learned Morse code too, but I, I yeah, haven't. Yeah, but I can't even hardly imagine listening to it and typing because then you're it's clack, you type, you're typing the, what the Morse the clack, code is. Clack, clack, clack of that, and, but you're still more stuff is still coming in. Yeah. That seems super hard to me, but yeah. some people. That getting going to that the guy that did that. I remember one time he he was so used to radios, shortwave radios, and and procedures and all that stuff. I was at his house one time. And we were listening. No, was, I guess it was at my house, in my apartment when you girls were little, and we were listening to my short wave. And he was, no, it wasn't typing, but he was just you know writing. He say what I said. Was it Morse code? It, yeah, it's Morse code. But but I was kept on. It's, I, he, had, he had to go to the bathroom, so I went to the bathroom. And while he was in the bathroom, I was listening to words, you know, stuff uh, on my short wave, and I. And he come back. I, I told him, "This is some guy, dumb dumb guy on the radio. I thought it was was uh, payday. He, he thought it was Friday or something." I says, "What? He said, what are you talking about?'" Oh, this guy kept hollering, "Payday, payday, payday!" Oh, Mayday! And he says, "That wasn't payday. That was Mayday. That was emergency." And who was that? But I was lying. I didn't. I didn't hear that. You I was just, just said that trying to play dumb. Yeah. <laughs> I was all, all excited. I always did stuff like that when I was. Younger, I would say something knowing that I was saying it wrong and trying to make people think I was dumb and they would all laugh. And I was like, <laughs> I, I also used to, uh, I, I could record on that radio, uh, I could record a, a message and then uh, on, on a tape recorder or, or uh, something, and then I, I'd fix it so that I could actually make that recording come over the radio. Weird. Wow. So, uh, you're, you're, are you in Okinawa at this time period when you're talking about all this stuff? I was never in Okinawa. I thought you were in Okinawa, Japan. I thought that's where you were stationed. No, I was, I was uh, uh, Tokyo and, and Misawa were both on the main island of Honshu. All my life, I thought you were in Okinawa. No, that's an island somewhere in the South Pacific. I know it's a real famous island. For yeah. some reason, I was thinking that's where you were stationed all my life. No, no. Oh my goodness. Well, when I was when I went from uh, first flew over to Japan, we stopped at Wake Island. And uh, I spent a, a couple of days there, uh, just waiting for my next transport. And and also we stopped in Hawaii for about a week. And nice. I spent a week in Hawaii. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, but wait. And so that was so that was your first experience. I mean, you were in Idaho, and then you went to California. Yeah. And then 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 Texas. Texas. And then you flew over to Japan. So Hawaii and all this stuff. So it was like, what did you like? Thought you were living the high life, seeing all these exotic places yeah. and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Well, we're we're on fifty two minutes now, so you want to tell any closing stories about Japan, and then next time we'll pick up from when you go back to see mom <sighs> and you go back. Like, well, I, I, how did you get out? Why did you say you got out early and stuff? Because I, I my I was my tour for to, to Japan was supposed to be two years, and at the end of two years. So I had spent enough time, uh, hadn't spent quite two years in to in Texas, and and basic training in California, so I didn't. I only had about, well, less than 180 days left on the four year max t uh, thing, and so oh. they decided that it wouldn't be worth their while to s s station me in another base in the states when I came back from Japan, so they just gave me an early out. So how many days did you have left? Uh, I think about 110 or something like that. Really? Wow. Yeah. And that was, and so your total time was would have been four years? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. All right, Dad. Well, that's very interesting stories. Most of those I had never heard before. <laughs> some, some, one I did, that one about the, you were running and you were about to play, and okay, I'm going to play out right here. <laughs> that was so funny. I'm going to play out, and then they're going to take me away to Amos, and I'm going to take, take it easy, but... Start beating the other guy up. Okay, oh never mind. Well, <laughs> now, nowadays they couldn't do that though. Yeah. The, the back in them days, they could actually physically abuse the, the trainees. They didn't do it much, but I they, think they still do. But but he did. They did much. it for a, a a lesson. Yeah. And not only did they beat him up, but they uh, there's two or three other guys that had done it. You know, that I didn't see. But when we got to where we would bivouac, which meant before we camped out, they uh, had to dig the trains, of course. And the guys that had fallen out had to camp downwind of the latrines. And the rest of oh, that stuff. was their placement? Yeah. Ooh. So what year was this when you were about to get out of the uh, 
the Air Force? I got out in 1958. 58, okay. October of 58. So you got in at 54? 55. Oh. Jan February 8th, 55. Okay. And the reason I turned 17 on January 31st yeah. at 55. Okay. But my buddy didn't, didn't uh, turn 8 till the till 8. Turned 17 until the 8th of February. So we did join it on the 8th of February. Okay. You have a very good memory of dates and stuff. <laughs> uh -huh. You have a very good memory of lots of stuff. All right, Dad, lots of interesting stories. So the next uh, installment of your life story, we will pick up on when you went back to Bermuda and uh, to reconnect with our my mother, your future wife. All right, All good right. stories, good times. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>